ministry through the years. Uh, you'll see a picture of my family up here in a minute. But thank you guys, because without the support, we couldn't do what we do. Without God, there's no way we would do what we do. And uh, so all credit to God, because yeah. he works it all out. I, I appreciate the song. I'm second to the last song was talking about Jesus' kingdom come. And uh, the thing is, when Jesus came, he said many times, I, I came to bring the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is what Jesus did first. He changed our hearts and minds. And then we don't live for ourselves, we live for him. Mm -hmm. So the kingdom comes through our little acts, as the song was saying. All these things we do change the world when we stop focusing on ourselves and we start focusing on the needs of the world. So I want to paint a picture of what was going on. Uh, I'm a mover, so I like to do that. I don't want to ruin the video. but um, We were involved in the, working in the Muslim world, uh, going to many places, but mostly Egypt, and spending months there uh, working amongst the Muslims. Uh, but something happened, COVID, and COVID caused us to have to go home because people in Egypt had to stay in their homes, so it was a very difficult time, and we couldn't do the ministry. So we came to Ukraine, which was our home, and uh, we were, okay, God, what do you want? Our plans were changed. You changed everything we had prayed about, and, and now what? And we didn't know what would be coming. But around that time, Russia had gathered several hundred thousand troops around Ukraine. And in 2014, if you remember, Russia invaded Simferopol, Sevastopol, and took our military bases and a lot of all the Ukrainian land down, that, down in that area. <laughs> so that was the start of the war. Ukraine was totally unprepared. They didn't believe Putin would actually do it, but he did. Uh, which was really heartbreaking because I have many friends in that area where, where I've worked, and now I cannot go to them and they cannot go to me because now it's Russia and it's Ukraine who are not officially at war, but as Putin would always say, it's an action by Russia. It's a good thing, according to the Russians. Um, but then Russia again in 2020-21 put another 200,000 troops around Ukraine, and with massive amount of takes in the tens of thousands and all sorts of armory. And they brought blood banks in, which is a really good sign there's going to be a war if they're bringing the blood banks in because they're getting ready for casualties. I really believe Putin was going to come in because he already showed that he would do that. Plus the 600 years of Russia, last, last 600 years of Russia, they've been an aggressive nation and have invaded many countries. Uh, Ukraine has never invaded a country in all its history, so you understand that. Ukraine is a very peaceful country, actually. 2021, um, I start getting ready for war. I buy a generator, I get gasoline and cans, I'm burying about 80 gallons of gas in different places in the yard because if the Russians come in, they're probably going to come in on our area. So if you look at this TV screen, and you can imagine, it's roughly kind of like Ukraine, okay? <laughs> On the far corner up there is where I live and my family, Baya and, and uh, Arena Samantha. Over here is uh, Chernigov, and you go down Lugansk and uh, Donetsk, and then you go down to Kherson, Kharkiv, and uh, Mariupol, which was totally destroyed. And this is where the war really went in. And, the Russians went into Kiev, but before that, all well, my friends were saying, James, it's not going to happen. Putin wouldn't do that. We have, they have family here, too. And I'm like, guys, he already did it once. I mean, there's so much preparation. I don't see he's any, there's any other option. I mean, why would he spend tens of millions of dollars a day to put people on the border? Just to scare us? That's not going to get him anything. Even Zelensky, two days before the war, did not believe the Russians were coming. So Ukraine, again, wasn't really ready for this war. And the people didn't believe that it would happen. On February 24th, um, sorry, I get emotional. Uh, very easy nowadays because <laughs> of all the things I've gone through. And I'll explain a little bit of that too. But on February 24th, I was up having my quiet time. It was about six in the morning. And it was a nice quiet time. <laughs> It was great. 
And I hear about 6.40, some thump. And I think, Marina, my daughter fell out of her bed or something. I thought, that was pretty loud. So I open up my sliding door, walk outside, and I see my neighbors also come outside. And we're all listening. And then another boom, boom. And we understood the war started. Now, where we were, there was about 60 or 70,000 troops ready to invade our area. And over here, there were also like 40 to 60,000. And down here, 40 to 60,000 troops. <clears throat> so, I and I, before this, when we thought they were going to invade, but we weren't sure, what do you do? Do you, what do you do? Do you run? Do you stay? Um, we had, from the first time, first part of the war, decided we need to pray and ask for God's direction and be obedient to what we felt the Lord leading us. So we prayed and asked God what to do. Leave, stay, take our kids out. But the Bible verse we got was, there's no greater love than one who's willing to lay down his life for his friends. So we believed that God wants us to stay. And we were like, what about our kids? You know, we know that people will think we're crazy, be irresponsible with our family. Um, and we did give messages like that too from family members. But we wanted to look at things through God's perspective. Our eternity is with God forever and ever. That's our future. Our time in here and this earth is very short and it's not as important as our eternal life with God. So the Bible says, don't hold on to your life, right? Jesus said, pick up the cross and follow me and do all these things. So we really felt the Lord say, as a family, you live or die, as a family. And that was a very difficult decision because I knew I could kill my own family with my decision as the head of the family. Um, believe me, I made that decision with great fear and trembling, and I weeped for three days making that decision on the cry. Because all I could do was picture the Russians coming in, and how was I going to defend my family, defend our city? Uh, everything's going through your mind. Also, uh, three, four cars drove up our street, parked in front of our house, and then get out, got out, came to us with three bottles, Molotov cocktails. And they taught us how to use them how to throw them on the Russian takes when they come in. I won't get into the details, but Molly and I looked at each other. This is surreal. So you can understand a little bit of what's happening in our hearts, the fear everybody's having, the panic. Well, when the war started, millions of people left, started to drive. We had car lines to the borders 20 miles long. And people stayed in those lines sometimes three or four days trying to get out of the country. Even though the Polish border, the Hungarian border were letting people through quickly, there were that many people leaving the country. Now, what is tough is when you make a decision to stay and you're ready to sacrifice your family, but your friends leave you. And they go to the border and call you, we're at the border. I'm like, what? We, we talked to the help we were staying. No, we're, we're gone. Sorry. How would you feel? <clears throat> now, one of the things, when we prayed, um, I looked at Bobby and I said, how can we leave like our friends? When we leave our friends, and maybe if the war ends and I come back and some of them are dead, some of them suffered, and I come back, do you think they're going to be open to hear what I have to say? Because James saved himself and his family. They stayed and fought. How would you feel? You would feel very betrayed and very hurt. You might accept them back, but deep inside you knew they didn't stand with you when it was terrifying. So all these things are going through your mind, and you don't know what's the right decision or not. That's why I lean on our faith and believe in Jesus Christ. And that's all you have. You know? He either is directing your path or he's not, and we choose to believe he's directing our path. And we choose to follow him, even if it means losing our lives. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. Part of the process of this is I had to decide, how am I going to let my children go through this? Am I ready to lose them? 
And so in my heart, I had to say many prayers, but God, okay, I trust you with my children. If you want to take them during this war, you can take them. If you want to take me, you can take me. If you want to take my wife, you can take my wife. But believe me, there's a lot of tears in those decisions because you don't have to make those decisions in, in life normally. Mm -hmm. But when you're in a situation of war and terror, you either make decisions or you run. And one of the things I did not want to teach my children to run. So during COVID, we went to people who were sick. We didn't run, try to save ourselves. In the war, I taught my children to go to the scary places, to go to the people who have needs because we have salvation. They don't. They're going to perish without Jesus Christ. No greater love than one who's willing to lay his life down for his friends. It's not, we're not heroes or anything. We're just Christians trying to fulfill the word of God and trying to do what Jesus called us to do. This is our calling. We knew this was our calling. We're going to show a video in a minute. Do you have my family up there yet? Password's not working. B, big B, I L L Y, B O B. B-I-L-L-Y. Yeah, I'll do it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it down. Right, right. Yes, um, uh, zero, zero. Oh, oh, two zeros out there? Yeah, yeah. Little detail there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> These are my treasures. Um, Bai and I adopted our daughters when they were three and four. And they are just my pride. I love them to death. They are just amazing girls. They're now, well, this is 16 and 17 years old. Um, so when the war started, everybody started to run. The Russians had invaded Ukraine. And people are running for their lives in the millions because the Russians are killing everybody along the way. They almost didn't spare anybody. So people were terrified and ran. Uh, the first car that came to us was a pastor and his family, he's got I think five daughters and his wife. And uh, they, they said, can we stay with you? Well, we have a small facility for 22 beds. And I said, of course, we'll take care of you. He goes, how much? I said, no, everything's free, of course. And the next day he comes to me and said, James, I can't stay. I told my wife, I gotta go back to my flock and save them. And I'm like, uh, it's occupied. And he goes, I know. And I said, okay, maybe I'll go with you. And he goes, no. I didn't ask my wife yet. <laughs> but he said, no, you're an American, they will kill you for sure. They won't. Or they'll the tell the truth horribly because they hate Americans. And I'm like, okay, but at least we can sponsor you. And he said, that's good because I don't have any money. So we paid for his car to be filled with gasoline and loaded it with food and he drove down to his area in Nizhen, it's next to Kozolets, and uh, he would bring out another group of people. But he said, James, the next day I gotta go back. This is a nine hour drive to this area. And I said, okay, I'll cover you. Filled his van up with foods, he goes down again. But this time, two other vehicles join him. And then more vehicles joined them. Pretty soon, there. And by the way, there was no gas stations open. They all closed, of course, because they're all targets. And the Russians did destroy many, many gas stations. But the gas stations that were closed, there was always one guy there to fill up somebody who's maybe going to do rescues or something. So they filled him up for free, oftentimes. Um, and that's a big sacrifice in Ukraine. But they understood we all need to help each other. The coolest thing happened was everybody was helping each other. So what happened overnight, literally, we were getting, uh, first we got like 30 people a day, and we would feed them everything they needed. We changed the beds every day. We bought mattresses, put them all over the floors. We were getting 60 people, 90 people. But then we were getting so many, we had to call up churches to say, can you handle people? And they're like, yes, of course. So it was just crazy. We were getting 160 people every day coming in to be fed. Buses were stopping by because they found out we're feeding people and they would take people to the border. We didn't have money for that. God raised up all that money and everything we needed. Like, it was unbelievable. Everybody was helping everybody to save people. Um, but it was very, very, very 
very painful because the stories you heard from those people coming in, for instance, one woman with her husband and her 10-year-old son were coming to us. Russians were ahead of them, stopped the car, they shot her husband in the head and killed him. She crawled with her son to a nearby um, house and uh, stayed there for three days. Then they came to us when the Russians left. They came straight to us in that state. We were getting stories of families who said, we had to take our kids and our parents, uh, our kids and we were driving, we need to drive to you, but we don't have room in our car for our parents. We had to leave them behind and we're gonna come back, try to come back and get them out. And the same day they get to us, they get a phone call, the Russians bombed your house and everybody's gone. This was every single day, story after story. I cried and cried every day. It was so heartbreaking because you see the whole nation. I mean, you're only hearing a couple of stories every day. Children going through stuff I can't say in the church you can understand. Awful, just awful. So the stress and everything was very, very difficult. And I was praying every day to God, God, I need strength to go through all this. It's just too hard. How can I go through this? And I'm doing Facebook videos because I want people to understand what's going on. And I was getting very angry with America for those first three months. America did nothing to help us. And the Ukrainians were fighting with machine guns and pistols. And some of them even have weapons. They didn't have medical kits. They didn't have supplies. They had one doctor and a troop of 500 people. And uh, they asked James, what can we do? And I said, I said, what can we do? I don't know. What do you need? And he said, we need medical kits. And I said, why? He goes, we have one medical kit for 500 guys and one doctor. I said, what? One medical kit? Every soldier is supposed to have a medical kit with them with tourniquets to save their life. They don't have them and they get wounded. That's the end. So it's a very, very difficult situation. But I call my brother in the North Washington. I say, hey, bro. This is the situation. Can we help? He said, yeah, I'll do what I can. And one day we raised $20,000 the first day after that phone call. People were coming to his house, bringing money, bringing checks. I was just blown away what happened. And we were able to supply 250 medical kits for those troops, which saved lives. And you guys are part of that. Yeah. Um, I could tell you many more stories about how we helped the military. We didn't provide weapons or anything like that. We provided things to keep them alive, to help them. Um, but after two and a half months, this, the uh, refugees stopped. Everybody had just kind of settled down. Those who left were gonna leave, those who stayed were stay. Ukraine was now trying to do offensive to kick the Russians out. And they kicked them out of Chernigov and a few other places. Um, America started to help, and it was a huge help. The Ukrainians are very, very smart people. They created all sorts of weapons out of drones and stuff. They started a new kind of technology and warfare that nobody else had before, but they have to survive. They, you know, they're smart. They came up with all sorts of things, which frustrated the Russians. And, uh, but now it's like, God, what do you want us to do? What do you want me to do? You know, what can I do now? So I took my, took my, uh, one of the volunteers that came, his name was Ivan. And there's actually a, a brochure of him in the back of the church with his family because I'm trying to raise support for his school. But Ivan was one of these guys from Belarus, our enemy, but he has Ukrainian passport and he loves Ukraine. He was helping me all the time handle all these people. He just said, James, can I do, what can I do? And the guy was like a tank. He could do anything and everything. It was like totally God sent. Um, I saw God's hand in everything we did. He was directing our path. He was providing everything we need. Um, but now I've taken this guy and I tell my wife, I wanna, I wanna go to the Chernigov area. It's free, the Russians just left. There's some danger there still. The Russians are talking about offensive back, but let's go in and take food to these people. 
let's do what we can. So we load up a van with food. My daughter, Samantha, says, Dad, I want to go. I'm like, Samantha, there's no way you're going to go on this trip. She goes, Dad, I'm a Christian too. I, I want to do this. Dad, come on. I said, well, if your mom agrees, okay. <laughs> Mom's going to say no 100%. So my wife's a prayer warrior. So she doesn't, she might say no right away, but then she'll pray. And that's what happened. She prayed and said, okay, Samantha, you can go. Um, so that was the start of my family going with me on these trips. We went there and we provided food for people. We went into the church and we shared the gospel and stuff. And it was just, that was kind of the start. But we didn't know what we were doing yet. We were, that was a scouting trip. You're going to see a video as the ministry starts to develop. Um, in this video, you'll see a small church, uh, a couple small churches. One was one of the first churches we went to. And in this church, uh, sorry, not a church, a village. When we went into this village, we had already gone to two other villages. I was already exhausted. I preached already two whole sermons. We did our testimonies and everything. And the stress and everything, you get tired really. So at this point, I'm sitting in the van. I say, God, let the team deal with it all. I'm exhausted. Let them just deal with it. I'll just sit here and survive. And, but if you want me to go out there, I'll go out there. And the girl behind me was in the bus I didn't know. And she goes, James, get out there and preach. <laughs> so I get out there and I start to preach. And one of the women stood up and she said, where was your God? When we were in the basements crying out day and night, and they're killing our people, where was your God? And I had this righteous anger come up a little bit. She's insulting my God, you know. But the other hand, she went through terror. So I gently just said, your God is with you the whole time. He never left you or forsake you. So he's not guilty of this war. She, she was saying, your, where's your God? Your God created this war. I said, we are simple people. We created this war. Putin is a simple man. He calls himself a Christian, but probably never opened the Bible once. And because of greed and envy and power, that's why he invaded Ukraine. So it's not God's fault. And one of our girls on the team went over and hugged this woman and they cried together for like five minutes, very long time. But she became the, the strong man for us in the future. And we've been back to that village seven or eight times now. Um, you'll see a school and it, you might not know it's a school but there's plastic on the windows and that's the only school that survived in the area the Kharkiv area that you probably heard in the news but I'll get them mixed up between Hearsol and Kharkiv and other places that you've never heard before and every school was destroyed this is the only school that was still standing but all the windows were blown out, and the windows were massive. They're like the size of this. And each one in Ukraine, it's like $300 to fix each one. I know they'd be more expensive here, but 300 bucks. And they have like 24 of these windows. Well, I don't have that much money. But I gave them some money to do two or three. And because corruption, I'm not 100% sure they're going to use the money in the right way. So I said, I'll give you some money and see what you do with it. And if you're faithful, we'll give you some more. And they also had a basement big basement, but it was all dirt and cement, and nothing was in it. <clears throat> and they said, we want to put this basement in because it will be a safe place for the kids. If the bomb's coming, then they will be in a safer place. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm not thinking, okay, there's like 60, 70,000 bucks or more. Uh, I'm like, I'd like to help. But we left and came back again to this village and they put the windows in so we gave them more money for five windows and we've been helping out with this school but it's the only school kids can go to in the whole region so all the kids have to be bused in there but you understand that there's bombs falling every day in these areas it's not safe but the ukrainians have a choice you either stay and live and live your life with that chaos or you run and leave just to get away from it well, many people left, right? But many came back with their children because they said, we're tired of running. We don't want to live anymore on the border. We don't want to live in another city. We want to live in our homes. Unfortunately, many can't come back because hundreds of thousands of homes are gone now. 
and you'll see some video that we're going to show. So this video, you'll see apartment buildings. Um, they were occupied. When you look at them, remember they were occupied. And, and, and it's just one area that I'm showing, but there are hundreds of areas like that. Besides the thousands of homes, they destroyed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of homes they have destroyed all over. So in our area, it is not like that. Just so you know, our area is pretty safe. I mean, the last bomb that came to us was a year ago. So the family stayed because they have school. My wife is ministry to the military women who need the support because their husbands are in the front line. And without Vaya's support, there's, as they told Vaya, I said, you're the only one that understands this. The other people who tried to work with us, they don't understand this. But for some reason, you do. As my wife is just this type of force that they respect. And uh, school have, kids have school, and I'm on a busy speaking tour, so I, my family can't enjoy it. Plus, getting out of the country is not easy, and, uh, and you have to go out of the country to fly out of the country. So you're looking at hotels, you're looking at sitting in the border minimum six hours, up to 12 hours. And my family said, we don't want to go through that. We'll, we'll come back to America when the war ends, when that is. So here's the video. It's the black one. Should we be behind them? There you go. Is the sound up? You're going to want the sound up on it. It's not going to be on there. It's going to be on your controller TV. Oh, this is the first day of the war. Zelensky saying, we are attacked by the Russians, but we will overcome with our military might. This is what we hear every day.
Hopkins uh, in Los Ukraine. This is the 99 for one team. We have more volunteers. We're going to the east to bring the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, to Ukraine, stopping corruption and uh, being a blessing to one another, serving one another. So pray for us. We need the prayers. Thank you. So when I watch this video every time, I, I can't watch it normally, um, especially the very beginning, because we've heard so many people crying out. But so many people, when we left, their attitudes totally changed from oppression, depression, to joy. And we come back to those villages, the village that I told you about where the woman was yelling, where's your God? The last trip we took, well, not the last trip, because we've already been there twice more since then, but uh, there was... I think we did five or six trips there. And we needed to go to a worse area called Parkeef. And they were occupied nine months by the Russians. And uh, we were to go to a church where the pastor was tortured terribly. And uh, as we told this congregation, 40, 45 people, we said, guys, it's going to be our last trip for a long time. We won't be able to come back to you. We just have these little gifts for you. And uh, we love you guys. We see your growth. We, we just, you know, we're sorry we can't come here for a while. And they stood up and they said, don't give us your food. Take it to those people who are ever worse than us. And we're going to gather potatoes to give to you to take, okay? These people are dirt poor. You can see their attitude already changed. Already changed. And it was, we just wept together with them because it was such an amazing moment. They went from a a village of terror and destruction and hopelessness to a village that was ready to send supplies to another city who were worse off than they. That bring, brought me great joy to see that. When we first started, we, we just didn't know how to approach the villages. We didn't know if they would accept us or not. And we were in a church where the pastor and his family and one of the, the assistant pastor and his wife are the only Christians to stay out of 200 people besides 11 drug addicts that were going through their rehab program. Everybody had left. And uh, I just said, hey, you know, they were getting food from uh, the UN, big box of food. Um, it was a mountain of it. And they wanted to give the people. So I just said, why don't you have them come to the church? We'll do our program. And you can give them the boxes and register them. And he's like, okay, let's do that. Well, at that time, a man named Keith Wheeler came to us. He's the guy that carries the cross all over the world. And he had been to 44 countries of war. We were in his 45th or 44th, I'm not sure. And he stood up there with the cross and gave such an amazing salvation message. But it wasn't sweet. It wasn't soft. It was to the point and explaining what a Christian is and that there's heaven and hell you get to choose. God doesn't send you to heaven. He doesn't send you to hell. You make that decision by accepting Jesus Christ, believing or not. And when he said, okay, I don't want you to raise your hands unless you're serious about reading his word and seeking him. If you're really ready to do that, you can raise your hand and we'll pray together. All 200 people raised their hand. Oh, praise God. And I was like, what? <laughs> okay, this guy is either very anointed or there's a movement of God. I didn't know at that point. But it, next hour was my turn to preach. And I'm like, God, this is kind of scary. Uh, I don't know, should I do it like he did it? Or should I do it like we traditionally do it? What, you know, is this you? What should we do? And I felt like the Lord said, do it as he did it. And I did it, and 200 people repented. I'm like understanding this is a movement of God. And... It really encourages. There was one more meeting that day, so 600 people repented that day. It was really awesome. And in that church, the pastor, um, we spent a lot of time together. And he said, can I talk with you privately in my car? And I'm like, okay, I have no idea what he's going to say. And he just broke down crying. He goes, how do I deal with all this? I, how do I deal with all this? I'm feeding all these people. I've got all this ministry I need to do with us. How do I disciple all this? How do I do this? And I said, well, let's pray. And we prayed, and I said, look, you have the Holy Spirit. You can't do things traditionally the way you would do them. You're going to have to trust the Holy Spirit like you never before. <coughs> Use these drug addicts. They know more of the Bible than these people. <laughs> Let them start groups. He did that and started attending churches. 
That was a year and a half ago. <laughs> and these people have been sober and doing a good job because they were given such a responsibility. But yet the pastor works with them every day for an hour a day, disciples them, and they go to their ministries. And it's just an amazing thing. And he's like, I can't believe this worked. And the whole Baptist Union all over Ukraine is like, what? This is not how we do it. But they see the fruit of it, and it's shaken them, which is a good thing. Um, we started going into these villages, but these villages were not as safe as Chernigov area. Chernigov area, they told us there's mines all over, be careful. We saw mines in the field. We saw rockets that didn't go off in the fields, and, and we were careful. We just walked on the paths. But they said, here's Sloan is worse. So when we got to hear song, we saw such devastation. It, it, you know, every day was was just you were in tears. You do the ministry, but by the end, you had so much emotions, and so much brokenness, and so many terrible stories you heard. But there was this joy at the same time because where every single village we went to, we gathered the, the head of the village, and we'd ask them, "Can you gather your village?" And she would gather the whole village. They would come, and we would do our program for them. And everybody, 95 to 100 percent, in roughly 150 to 100 villages, 170 villages, all repented. So people are hungry. War is a terrible thing. I would not wish war on anybody. But the thing about war is God turns what Satan means for evil and can turn it into great good for those that love him. And we didn't want to see the Ukrainians suffer. See, in our area, in Ukraine, it's three plus percent. Where I live, it's eight percent Christian. In the other areas, it's one, two, three percent. But in this site, it's 0 0.02 percent. They all say they're Christians, but nobody reads the Bible and they don't know even what Jesus Christ did on the cross. They, they can't even answer simple questions. So we understood there was a huge deficit the people were so hungry. Um, I gotta tell you a funny story. We'll give some levity to it. So we're going to this village in, in Kharkiv area. And uh, when you're going through these areas, there's a lot of stress because there are rockets flying over your head. And there's sometimes mortars coming near you. And people are ducking in the car, hoping the shrapnel won't get in. I said, what are you ducking for, guys? It's going to go right through the car. It's going to go through all of this. It's not going to help you. <laughs> um, we refuse to wear bulletproof vests, as many of the other people would do and all that, uh, because we don't want to come into villages like, you know, they're not wearing bulletproof vests. Many of the missionaries who are, well, there's not a lot actually going. They're fully costumed. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying we want people to relate to us and see that we're on their level and uh, that we love them and want to come and show the love of Jesus Christ to them. When we go to a village and we gather the people, I know they think we're getting paid to come. And I have to explain to them, first of all, we are not trying to get you to come to my church. We don't care about you coming to my church. We want you to come to the Bible you have at home, what it says there. We want you to come to Jesus Christ. You come to Jesus Christ. And um, we explain, we don't, we're not coming here because we're getting paid. We're paying to come to you. I could be in Hawaii sitting on a beach, drinking a cola. But we want to be with you because we know the truth, and the truth is the only hope for Ukraine. Jesus Christ is the only hope for Ukraine. There is no other hope for Ukraine. Ukraine is steeped in corruption. You all know that. And so is Russia. And so is the whole world right now. Mm -hmm. But the problem with corruption in Ukraine is the military doesn't get supplied what it needs, right? Why do we have war? Why were we unprepared? Because our government officials stole the money and the military and our people were unprepared. And I pointed out, guys, it's great that you're going to repent, but we need to stop corruption. There needs to be some fruit in our life. And I know most of you thinking it's impossible to stop corruption. 
right? And a lot of them are like, yeah, okay. As long as you believe it's impossible, it will never happen. As long as you believe it is possible, then we have hope. But first, we have to receive Jesus Christ here and here and have a change of heart and mind and believe in Jesus Christ and also to fulfill his word. We don't live anymore for ourselves. We have two, 350 to four, 500,000 Ukrainians who have died and given their life for this country. But you want to still pay a bribe? And those bribes have killed our soldiers because we're continuing to pay bribes and our soldiers are not fitted. We've got to stop this because you have your children. You want a future for your children. Then we need to stop this. Not Zelensky. We need to stop this. Stop paying the police. Stop paying for your documents. Do what you need to do legally. Guys, how many people died for Ukraine? And you, you're going to still pay a bribe? Most people understand we need to stop corruption. So every village we go to, we talk about stopping corruption. And people agree once I share that with them. They're all like, yes, we can. But I know when you hear a new idea, it's something hard to do. You have to say it three, four, five times to them. So we do go back to these villages. We've taken 500, we've gone to 500 villages. It's a lot of villages. Five, about 150 to 170 villages, but we keep going back to them. We can't go to everyone. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough resources. But God has provided what we need, and God is moving powerfully in there. And there are a few other people who are doing the type of work we're doing. I'm amazed when I get volunteers who want to come. I'm going to tell you one of our trips. This, is, this was the worst trip. On this, uh, we had a family rule that only one of my daughters would go with me. You won't have to make this decision, I hope, in your life. Only one would go with me because if she dies, one would still be with Bogdan, my wife. But when you do ministry like that, you have to think and do things you never would have to have to do. Um, Funny story. Ah, oh, I got away from that one already. <laughs> okay, funny story. So we're in this village, and it's only got eight houses left, and they were almost in the middle of a massive war, and there's mine signs everywhere. The Russians are gone, the Ukrainians are gone, but there's these houses, and we want to reach these houses, and I have to use the toilet. <laughs> but there's mine signs everywhere. We go outside oftentimes, but there's mine signs everywhere. But right in front of this house is this field with a beautiful view and a big pile of sand about as high as this piano. And I thought, okay, I'll go behind there. Everybody can see what I'm doing on the team, but nobody can see what I'm doing. They can see that I'm, but they can't see it. So I walk back there and I start and everybody's looking at me smiling. And this woman comes out of the house, this grandma, and she goes, what are you doing here? This is in Russian. You idiot, that's a minefield. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not always serious so I said well when you gotta go you gotta go and, was like, <laughs> and then I looked how did I walk in here and I didn't remember so I said okay God I'm just gonna walk out please spare me and then I walked out and everybody's James you should know better than that and I said it didn't have any mind signs everything has mind signs all over the place but here <laughs> and that was a good lesson. We've had a few incidences where we parked our cars in minefields, and we didn't know. Only later when we parked, they said, do you know that's a minefield you just parked in? Like, oh. God's been very gracious to us, very gracious to us. One man in a village, it's, it's, there's clean villages and not clean villages. When you go to a village that's not clean, <coughs> excuse me, it means... There was just warfare there, and there's a lot of mines and shrapnel and rocket parts and bullets and all grenades and mines that they scoop up in a big pile in a couple places, and then later they have special equipment to scoop it all up. So a guy gave me this rocket bottom, and it was bronze, and it was kind of cool. So Yvonne, my big guy, um, I'll show you how big he is. He's just a little bit bigger than me, but he's big. He doesn't look like in the video, but he is. He took me. 
and twirled me around like this. And I'm almost 200 pounds. And he had no problem doing that. <coughs> so he goes to this mine, this pile of shrapnel, and I don't know this, because I'm in a block away speaking to people about Jesus Christ. And he and my two of the young guys on our team decided to find cool stuff. So he picks up what he thinks is a rocket bottom. He looks and turns it over, he realizes it's a mine. And the first reaction, he threw it, which is another mistake. But praise God, it was a tank mine, which needs 750 pounds or more to set it off. It didn't go off. Yeah. So here they're telling me this. I'm like, oh, I have enough stress, please. Just stay out of the, stay out of the shrapnel, okay, guys? Um, but there's a million stories that went on. One village that really caught my heart, and it was one of the last, we've been there only two times now, and it was one of the last places we've been. That was kind of like a new place. We had done a, a evangelism in a bigger village, and uh, when we were done, everybody was very joyful and happy, and I said, is there any other villages around here? I said, yeah, there's one down the road, you gotta go down here, but you need to be careful because everything is mine, including the road. But if you follow the tracks of the deminers, you'll be okay. So I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound very wise. And he wants to, let's go. I'm like, okay, we'll go. Didn't pray about it. But I said, okay, let's go. Samantha is riding with Yvonne. We have radios in the car so we can have good communications. It helps us because we can joke a lot and take the levity of the situation away. So we turn onto this road, and Yvonne is following the tire tracks exactly how he can. But he's playing loud worship music in his car, and all the youth there are having a great time. Youth being my daughter and several people in their 20s. And they're worshiping God going down, and ours is dead serious. <laughs> and I'm like this driving, God, help me to stay in the line. God, why did I let Samantha be in there? If that blows up, I is going to kill me. That's really what I was thinking. And uh, we drove down there and we get to this village and there's men in special mining costumes to protect them from, from something blowing up, which only helps in small mines. <clears throat> and we asked them, where can we go here? Uh, are there people here? And they said, yeah, there's six or seven here. So um, he said, there's people in the house, which was right where we were standing. And so I yelled out, hey, can you guys come out? And this man and woman came out. And they said, right around here it's safe. You guys are good. But don't go over there. Don't go over there. And I said, well, we would like to gather your village together. And he's like, okay. So he takes us to a pile of rockets, parts, and stuff. It's kind of cool. You see all these rockets, pieces. And it's interesting to see this stuff. And we're looking around there. And it's pretty safe. And then he goes and leaves us there as we mess around and then we see people coming, <coughs> excuse me, seven people all together. And they were all uh, from 30s to 50s. And we gather them together and there's no place to sit. So I said, hey, Vaughn, I'm really tired. Can, can I sit on your guitar? It's actually my guitar, but he's responsible for it. He's asked to sit down. I don't play the guitar, but. Um, so I sit on this and we just talk about Jesus Christ and salvation and what Jesus Christ did. And these people received Jesus Christ with tears and joy. And it was like night and day um, to watch the change in them immediately. Uh, and they were so kind and so loving and so appreciative. They told us how they were radioing in, risking their lives, positions of the Russians, which is definitely risking their lives and how they were able to destroy a couple columns of the Russians by them calling in the positions of the Russians. Well, the next time we went, we, we left that village with joy, very carefully. And the next time we came in, it's the same situation, and we gathered them together, and the wife of that house, she goes, can you guys come in? I want to give you soup. And I'm like, they have nothing. And they don't even have a roof on their house. It's a blue tarp over there, the tresses of the house. But we go in, and the room is very, very small, and there's 10 of our team and seven of them in this room, and we're all standing like this. 
And she goes, oh, I want to give you soup. And I said, a little pot of soup. It's going to feed maybe six, seven people. I said, no, we're not hungry. And she goes, no, I want to serve you guys soup. This is, you know, these people are really suffering. And she's going to give her last, maybe last soup. And I'm like, no, no, we, we really don't want the food. But if you want to make us tea, because we brought tea to China, we would be so happy with that. And she goes, really? And I said, yeah. So she made us tea. And it's very important in Ukraine to accept hospitality. But you need to find a way. You know, these people are suffering, and they were going to give you the last food. I don't want to take their last food. And I said, well, we want to do our program again to encourage you. And she goes, it's okay, but you can't do it here. We're all smashed together. And I said, yeah, do you have another room? She goes, yeah, you can go in this room. So we opened the door. There's no roof, just the blue tarp. It's freezing. It's like minus three. And it was just an amazing time of worshiping God with joy and hearing the word of God with joy to see these people receive Jesus Christ. That's the only good thing coming out of this war. Besides, Ukrainians are starting to be more patriotic and love their country for the first time because they always felt ashamed. The Soviet Union did a good job of making you feel ashamed if you're from Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, or Uzbekistan, or Ukraine. Unless you're Russian, you're nobody. Um, and one more story on, on that situation. Um, No, I won't go into that. So then we hear, here Solon is free. Now here Solon is where the Russians are still fighting. They're on one side of the river and on the other side is here Solon. It's a big, big city, very modern city, very European city, beautiful. So we drive in there for the first time and we had arranged with the pastor um, to house us. But we had no idea what we were walking in. To. And we hear boom, boom off in the distance constantly. Boom, boom. It's kind of far away, but then boom. And I'm like, are they attacking or baiting? And the, the elder said, no, this is every day. It's, this is normal. This is okay. I'm like, this is okay. Okay. So we, we get in there. We're staying there. And all night long, bombing near us. Not just far away, near us. They're bombing all around because the Ukrainians are positioned all over the city on the outside. But the Russians just, they, you hear on the news that they don't attack civilians, right? <laughs> they're not after, they're only after our soldiers. Well, if that's true, then why are there tens of thousands of buildings gone? Tens, hundreds of thousands of homes gone? Why are there thousands, tens of thousands of civilians killed? Um, it's not true. Why are all the hospitals destroyed, all the libraries destroyed? They know what they're shooting at. But the, the bad story. So, this is the story where Samantha Marie and Bayi was the first time Bayi said, I think Bo should go with you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and uh, the first day we go out to this field, and in this field, <coughs> We're driving along. It's just a field way out in the Thule's. And we're heading to a village that's way out there. And here comes two rockets right over the top of us. And one blows up right over us. And we're all like, Arena actually caught it on video. We were like, what's going on? This is, who is this? And we realized it's our guys. They were shooting something above us. We don't know what they were shooting, a drone or something. So we're not sure what's going on. The next day, uh, two days later, We've already hit nine villages, and people were repenting everywhere. It's, it's, it's wonderful, right? But the next day, everybody's asleep, and it's midnight. And at midnight, I'm lying there. I can't sleep for some reason that night. And a massive explosion, so big that the whole house shook. Everything shook, and I got up and thought, oh, they blew up the church. It was the biggest explosion I heard. And I went to the window to look uh, in the corridor, and everything was fine. You know, it, bought, it blew up somewhere nearby, but I don't know where. And one of the girls in the team, she says, everything okay? And I said, yeah, kind of, but often it comes in twos, so be ready. And I'm thinking, I, I gotta go to the toilet. Another, <laughs> if another one hits me, I don't wanna, in my pants, you know? So I, 
I run to the toilet really quick and take care of it. And right when I came out, another massive <coughs> explosion. But this time, everybody, including the military that lived in the house, came out. Samantha threw herself on the floor in hysterics, terrified. And so I gathered everybody. I said, everybody downstairs. Um, this is the hard part about being a leader. You have to make decisions. You have decisions either by faith or decisions by emotions. So I gather everybody downstairs. And uh, I'm saying, guys, let's pray. I'm going to pray. But one woman's yelling, everybody get to the bomb shelter. Everybody get to the bomb shelter. But I'm feeling, no, let's pray. If I'm wrong, I'm guilty of killing everybody. This is what's going through my mind. But also going through my mind, I am the leader. So if God really wants us to go to the bomb shelter, he would put it on my heart to say, yes, let's go to the bomb shelter. But all this is going through my mind. All at the same time, and I'm feeling a little bit of stress. And uh, everybody's got their cell phones off. You're terrified to have any light because if a drone sees light, they'll get coordinates and blow the whole house up. So everybody's pretty scared at this point. And I prayed, and I said, guys, I feel like the Lord said go to bed. It's okay. And one of the military guys started telling soft little stories to calm everybody down for like a half hour, which was really good. Everybody went to bed and slept. <laughs> Two days later, it's the last day. Ah, sorry. The next morning, I get a phone call from my wife who heard what happened. <laughs> and she goes, James, it's not just that. So there's 800 tanks on the border and 100,000 troops ready to invade. Get out now. I'm like, okay more stress I said to my wife look you know me I'm going to pray and I'll make a decision that way not by you but by God and my wife said okay I know you go pray just let me know what's going on so I prayed and I felt like I know it doesn't make sense guys, but I felt like leave a day early that's all so I told my wife and she's like okay I trust you and it uh, doesn't mean something bad can't happen I'm not God. I'm just trying to make decisions with God and trying to trust and have my faith put in God in the worst situations. This is discipleship. It doesn't seem easy, but this is discipleship. I've had the privilege and oddity of having teams in four different countries at war and having to make life and death decisions. This was the worst. I had told the team we're not going to leave early. And I've never seen a drone. I just, just mentioned, I never saw a drone in a moment. I've seen hundreds of rockets land nearby. I've seen, you know, all sorts of stuff, but never a drone. And everybody goes to bed. It's our last night, and everybody's supposed to get up at 4.30 in the morning to have quiet time, and we're going to get on our road. So, again, I can't sleep at night. It's 12 o'clock, and I hear... Oh, by the way, in, in, when you're at war, everybody has to be off the streets by 8 o'clock. Nobody is allowed to be on the streets. You will be killed or put in prison because the military moves at night. And the military does not want anybody to see where they're going because there are traitors. A lot of Russians living all over Ukraine still, and often they get positions in Ukrainian forces. So I'm lying in bed and I hear this moped <laughs> at midnight. <laughs> idiot is out there riding a moped. And then I realize, oh, maybe that's a drone. So I go to my window, and all of a sudden, all this machine gun fire about 400 yards from us is going off just massively with tracers. And it's like, oh, this is crazy. And I'm ducking. <laughs> it's actually going over our heads, so it's not coming down. They're shooting at a drone, which at first I couldn't see. But then I hear, eh, and I see it. And, it. and it's a big drone. It's from like me to you with wings on it, and it's full of explosions. It's the kamikaze drone, it's called the Shahid. It goes down in massive explosion. I'm like, oh man, I say to the guy, to my roommate, I say, they just probably killed a bunch of our guys. And I go to bed thinking that's it, and I, I pray, I pray a lot. Every time I hear a bomb, I pray. Every time there's a cyber, we pray. It's a tradition for everybody to pray. And uh, 10 minutes later, I hear, eh, again, I'm like, oh, no, I go 
go to the window, same exact situation going on. Machine gun fire, and I'm like, this is crazy. And this is very stressful, guys. This is all that it takes is for somebody to shoot down or something, and our building will be hit. And I'm like, God protect us from all this. We had six drones in a row come just like that. Oh. Exactly. And I I'm like, how do you sleep after that, right? Four o'clock, I'm going to have my quiet time with God. I get up, and the Russians just bomb the city crazy. I'm like, God, get us out of here, please. Alive, please, get us out of here. The team's getting up at 4.30. We have our quiet times. We have um, we have uh, a 10, 20-minute devotional encouraging one another in our faith. But one thing we do every day is what's called debriefing, and anybody in the military understands that term. So we, to keep our sanity, we all share what's going through our minds at the time, things that break our heart, um, and we all share that. Some men don't want to do that. And we had one guy on our team, he went to volunteer in Butcha. You probably heard a lot about Butcha in Kiev, where the Russians killed 450 people in one day. And it was kind of the beginning of the war, and it's just outside of Kiev. Um, he was there helping out as a volunteer afterwards. When he came home, he didn't talk anymore. He didn't talk to his wife, his kids, anybody. He went into deep depression. And I just said to him, look, Andre, you didn't debrief at all. I know. You need to debrief. He's not a guy that likes to talk. He said, but you need to come with us on one of these trips. And But you have to debrief. I'm not going to let you not debrief. Don't tell me you don't want to debrief. Because you're in the situation you are, you're going to lose your family very soon if you don't start to open up. He came with us, and he didn't want to speak. Yvonne, my big guy, didn't want to speak either, but I remind him, you guys gave me a word if you're going to do this. But because they did, they spoke about everything that was going on. We wept together. We cried. You know, it really changed his whole life. That amount of time coming together and sharing your emotions, what went on, the pain, that you understand everybody else is feeling the same way. Sometimes you feel like you're alone, that you're carrying all this pain yourself, but you're not. We had a couple trips like that. That was the worst trip. After that trip, my we came back to Lutsk with the team, and Vi had called and said, I want to feed everybody dinner. So I, I told the team, Vi is going to feed us all dinner, and then everybody came to home. And Vi asked, how many of you would go through that again? Everybody raised their hand. I'm like, what? <laughs> I even went, what? I'm looking at them like, are you guys nuts? I would do it. But I'm like, why would other people want to do this? I mean, I'm nuts, but why? All these guys are nuts. That guy was awesome. We got to see so many come to Jesus and minister to people. It's so awesome. I mean, yeah, that's true. But I'm a wreck inside, mentally, physically exhausted and broken. And I'm like, these guys are okay. But four days later, I'm getting phone calls. Uh, my mom and dad are upset because I'm screaming every night and night. I can't sleep. And our hair is falling out. And they said, we realized how much it affected us to go to these places. We didn't know how much it affected us. When I tell people we go to these villages, why we go to these villages, is we don't say we go to this just because God sent us. We tell them we go in there because what God did in us changed our lives. And I want you to have that same experience because God can change your life and change Ukraine and give hope to Ukraine. Only God, the only hope for Ukraine is God. Ukraine will not change and become a great nation without God. And that's the only hope. And we, we let them know this. So we have seen great movements in, of, of God in miracles. We've seen God save our lives in other trips where bomb, Russians were bombing us personally in our vehicles. God saved us. I think I shared a lot. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you for hearing me hearing a little bit of my heart, the heart of our team, heart of the people in Ukraine, because Ukrainian people are very concerned. People have forgotten them. And if many people say, James, tell them what it's like. Let them know. It's not 14 bombs. It's 2,000, 5,000 every single day. 
That's the reality of Ukraine. And Ukraine is not guilty of what Russia is saying. That's all not true. And I can prove it to you if you ever want to. But anybody have questions about all this? As long as you're not going to hurt me. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we live in a broken world. Lord, it's, it's hard for us here in the comfort of the United States to visualize and understand. Lord, I thank you for this man who loves you. Mm -hmm. Lord, is willing to go out and risk his life over and over and over again, to risk the life of his family, to bring your word and to bring some relief to these people who are so desperately broken that we can't even begin to Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to be with him and anoint him and give him everything that he needs, Lord. Mm -hmm. I pray that you would open up the hearts of the people that he's going to talk to all across the Northwest, Lord. Mm -hmm. That they would give freely and support in any way, prayerfully support, financially support, in any way possible, Lord, that they would be drawn to support this effort. And Lord, I lift it all up to you. In the name of Jesus Christ and Nazareth. Amen. 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 Thank you. So, if by chance there's somebody here that didn't get a hug, <laughs> that doesn't feel well to appreciate it, I'm not sure you get a hug. <laughs> but you'd stand and receive your blessing. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your provision. Yes. Lord, we ask that you would guide us in every step and every move that we make and every word that we say, Lord, that we be guided by your Holy Spirit, that, that your plan in our lives and the lives of the people around us will come to fruition. In your holy precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.